needed. I guess nobody else is going to like them, but she likes them. No, I'm just kidding. It was really awesome. And, and here's the thing about Christian music. And, and from the very earliest believers, they sang songs to remind them of what matters. You know, this series is going to do that, I promise you. Today we're going to talk about how do I prepare my heart. We're starting hashtag Jesus series. And this is on the book of Mark. And I'll be honest with you, I've never taught a series on the book of Mark. And most pastors haven't. Here's why. Mark is very interesting. It is almost like the Cliff Notes version. Now, you would think, because it's the Cliff Notes version, that should be the one I use the most. Because uh, in school, that was typically true. Um, uh, uh, Mark is the book. Uh, Mark was a contemporary of Paul's. And he also uh, was friends with Peter. Uh, uh, probably knew Mary, too. Peter, Paul, and Mary. But... Um, that was an old person joke. If you got that at all, you're old. But anyway, so, so he was friends of Paul. Uh, and then, of course, he's the one that they had such a sharp disagreement that basically Paul kicked him off his trip. Uh, he remained very close to Peter. And then, of course, Paul, at the very end of his life, near the end of his life, actually commended him uh, um, for his work. So, um, so Mark was the one who took Peter's stories and wrote them down. Now, they're not written in chronological order. Uh, Mark is written more like, hey, then this happened, and then this happened, hey, and then this happened. Hey, and you know what else happened? This happened too. So don't take Mark and try to put things in order. It will mess you up. But the truth is, it's a great book, especially for those of us who have a little attention deficit. And what I'm going to try to do, which is going to be very difficult, is go a chapter at a time. The difficulty with that is that each chapter has like four different stories um, because of how Mark does it. Now, I don't know what kind of mood you're in, but I want to tell you the dream I had last night. And maybe this will relate to you. This is absolutely true. I'm not making this up. Not that I ever make, I don't ever have to make stuff up. Usually I'm dumb enough. I had a dream that I was driving my car with my family and I would hit the gas and it would go too fast. And then I would hit the brake and it would go faster. And then I would hit the gas and it would go fast. And I would hit the brake and it would go faster. Everything was broken. I felt no control. I think a lot of us are feeling that way right now. I honestly feel like a lot of people feel like I don't know what to do or even what to say. They feel like if I say the wrong thing, people get mad. If I do the wrong thing, people get, I'm just going to hide, you know. And, and then you hide and people tell you, well, you know, you need to get out. It's not good for you to hide, you know. And, and so no matter what you do, you feel wrong. And here's the good news. The book of Mark was most likely written in the time when Christians first started facing persecution. It was written most likely at least to Rome, possibly in Rome, to people who had begun being misunderstood as Christians. Who no matter what they did, they couldn't control the outcome of what was happening. No matter how much they prayed, it seemed like Nero was going to come after them. And he did. But the early believers, because of their faith in Christ, were able to endure. And so I wanted to go back to this book of Mark, knowing that it took us back to Jesus. And I want to just give you a, a real quick uh, a thing on, on how to prepare your heart. So Jesus says in John, I've got to be careful of my computer. Jesus says in John 738, whoever believes in me, as scripture said, living water will flow through them. So you think of your life when you spend time in prayer, when you spend time with God. That his Holy Spirit just pours his water into your heart. But then you have to live. And so you get up. And your day started off really well. You had a good day in prayer. But then you go out and, and, and you say the wrong thing to somebody. And suddenly you, you're not quite as clear as you were a minute ago. And then maybe after that, you watch the news. Boy, that was a mistake. You just you started to, to think that life was going to be easy and and suddenly things got, and then, and then you were in a good mood, and then one of your family members said something to you that you didn't like, and you handled it the wrong way. And then you got in the car, oh boy. And before you know it, life is cloudy. And you're having a hard time hearing God. And you're feeling frustrated. And just like me in that dream, you feel like no matter what you do, you're out of control. Let me tell you the answer to that, and I cannot do this on this stage. 
But if you imagine that instead of a, a coffee pot, that this is a fire hose. And when we get away from the world, when we turn off the distractions of the world and we allow the power of God to allow his living water to flow into us, it flushes all of this out. But as you go through your day, as you go through life, you're going to have these moments when things get cloudy. And so today I want to give you four ways that you can bring your life that may feel like this right now back to that clarity, back to having I'm going to not put this up here either for you there, Dave. I saw Dave kind of look at me like, please don't spill that on the piano either. So how can we do this? So I'm going to talk about this idea of, of how God can use what's going on in your life. And I've got four things. Number one, let your life prepare the way. And we're picking up in the book of Mark. And you want to read this book, this chapter this week. And just, just pour over it. Let this... Word of God flow through your life and change you to, to flush out the things that we get focused on. Here's what he says. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. By the way, I had a whole sermon just on that word, but I don't have time. It means anointed one. The son of God, as it is written in Isaiah, the prophet, he says this. <clears throat> I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness. Time out. So, so John is Jesus' cousin. John's the one that jumped in the womb. If you remember that story with Elizabeth. And, and when Jesus first showed up, Elizabeth, you know, sang the song, you know, like, I'm so excited. I just can't hide it. I'm about to lose control. It was something like that. I don't know. You'll have to look it up in the Bible. Uh, it's a little different, I think, than that one. But it's close. But it's close. She was so excited. She couldn't hide it. And, and John was so excited. He couldn't hide it. In, his, in the womb, he jumped, by the way, which is one of the reasons that we talk about uh, uh, the baby uh, uh, being aware before it's ever born. But that's another story for another day. So John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance. What does repentance mean? To change your mind. And we're going to talk about repentance a lot today. For the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Now, some, by the way, went out to just criticize him. Did you know that? There were, there were Pharisees and Sadducees that would go out just to kind of see what was going on. It was like the big show in town. And here's why. <laughs> listen, to, listen to what this spectacle guy was. John wore clothing made of camel hair. Let me just advise you. Do not wear clothing made of camel hair. That would be my advice to you. It's scratchy, not comfortable clothing. Wool sweaters are much more comfortable than this. Okay, So he made... Uh, clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. Now, we don't know if this was locust the bug or locust the plant. There's actually a plant in that area called a locust plant. But as weird as the camel hair clothing is, it wouldn't surprise me if the dude ate bugs. Not the worst thing you could eat, by the way. And then it says this. And, this, and, and he ate locusts with, and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. Now that's a big deal. I, I'm not even, I don't even deserve to untie your shoes, he says. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now let me tell you, about John the Baptist. The reason that John the Baptist was ready for Christ to walk in. Was because John the Baptist. You ready? Ready? Was ready for Jesus to walk in. So let me ask you this. Are you ready? For God to do something in your life. Are you prepared? To allow God to change the way you think about life. Are you willing to let God change the way you think about sin? Are you willing to let God change the way you think about that person that you don't like? Is there anybody that when you think of them, you grit your teeth? Would you be open to the possibility of saying, God, I will allow you to change how I feel about that person that I've struggled to forgive? Can you Prepare the way in your heart. And the only way you can do that is to be 100% open to let God do what only God can do. 
See, because we have habits in our life that we like. And the truth is, they actually say that in our brains, it, once we do habits a certain way, our brains actually adjust to it. That's why sometimes when you're driving to work, the first time you go, it seems like a forever drive. And the second time, and then someday you show up for work and you don't remember driving there. Anybody ever do that? You show up at work, anybody, you raise your hand at home. Anybody? Anybody? I'm looking. It's going to take a minute before they catch up. Okay? And you don't remember driving here. Scientists say this is why. Your brain, after you do a certain habit a certain amount of time, it literally powers down and only looks for threats. So sometimes if you're on the way to work, you're just driving there, driving there, and your brain goes, autopilot. You ever said, I don't know. And then you don't remember driving there. Why? Your brain literally powers down. Listen, some of us have negative ways of thinking that have become so ingrained in us that we, that's just normal for us. It's normal for us to see the negative in everything. It's normal for us to complain about everything. We, we've been hurt so many times that it's normal for us to push people away. It's our habit. We've grown a bad habit of how we think. Are you willing to let God break through your habits? Now, let me tell you the other thing science have, scientists have discovered. If you drive a different way to work, your brain will wake up. But I'll tell you something about that. It's also more difficult. I sometimes take a longer way to places because I like my brain to go to sleep. I like to not sit there and go, am I ever going to get there? And some of us are so used to being a certain way. Maybe we're used to pushing people away. Maybe we're used to helping in this area, but not helping in this area. Maybe we're willing to let God work in this area of our life, but God, you're not allowed in this closet. I got this closed closet over here. You're not allowed there. And God said, do you want to prepare the way for me? Then we, you and I need to be open to what he says here. The Holy Spirit coming and questioning every part of your life, working in every... Are you willing to let him challenge your thinking? about people, about things, about how you look at life, about sin in your life, about the things you do, about the ways you act. If you're open to allowing him to change you, then you're beginning to prepare the way with your life. So as you become aware of it, the next thing you need, you need his spirit. And that's point number two. We let our life prepare the way and then listen to what the spirit has to say. Now, I had a huge problem yesterday. Yesterday is huge. You, you're not going to, I think some of you and men, especially, I think you can relate to me. I was tired. I went to sit down and I could not find the TV remote. I could not find that TV remote. And suddenly that TV remote was the most important thing in the world. Now, the good news is I have Dish Network. And Dish Network has a little button on the box. So that box doesn't get lost because it's attached to the wall. So you walk over there and you push the button, but here's what happens. It sounds like it goes beep, 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 but it sounds like it's everywhere in the room. So you hear beep, 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 and you walk over here, beep, 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 and it takes you forever, if you're like me, to figure out where's that sound come from. Finally, you reach down between a couple of the couch cushions and beep, 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 but you drop everything to do it. Listen. What if listening to God in your life became as, as important as the remote? What if when you began to feel disconnected from God, when you began to feel frustrated, when your life began to feel cloudy and you felt like you were aggravated or irritated, you forgot about the joy of the Holy Spirit, you began losing the love in your life, you found yourself. What if that was so important to you that you stopped everything you were doing and said, God, I need your spirit. How many of us would have our hearts ready to serve God if we made listening to the Spirit as important as losing the remote? By the way, we've all lost something that we searched for and couldn't quit searching for it until we found it. What if we did that with the Holy Spirit? At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Somebody asked, does that work for a boss if you have a bad boss? Listen. If you have a boss or even a spouse that's giving you a hard time, one of the best things you can do is listen to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk about that in a second. That's actually in my notes. So just hang in, hang in. I saw that online there. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. The dove all through the Bible representing peace. 
and a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love with you. I am well pleased. By the way, some of you need to realize God says that to you too. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you have it together. It doesn't mean you don't mess up. It doesn't mean you don't blow it. It doesn't mean that God isn't trying to help you to become more than you are. But he absolutely loves you. And then he says this. At once the spirit sent him into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. We know that he didn't have uh, uh, food or water for those 40 days. He was with wild animals and angels attended him. And we know the whole story in one of the other gospels that gives all the temptations. By the way, Satan loved to twist scripture to tempt Jesus. One of the things he said to him is, hey, hey, if you trust God, just throw yourself off of this temple. And Jesus went back to an Old Testament that said, hey, just because that's in the Bible, this verse is also in the Bible. It doesn't just mean throw yourself off the temple. Don't, don't just, you know, he'll lift you up. So don't, you don't have to worry about anything. No, no. He still gave you common sense. He was with the wild animals, angels of tenement. And then Jesus announced the good news after John was put into prison. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. And then he said, repent and believe the good news. What does that word repent mean? Repent means 180 degrees, a change of mind. When's the last time you've thought about something differently? See, if you and I allow the Holy Spirit to impact our lives, the Holy Spirit that came on Christ, the Bible says when you become a Christian, that same Holy Spirit lives in you. And when you allow the Holy Spirit in your life, He will change your thinking. And this is how it works at work. You have a boss that's giving you a hard time. You're struggling because that boss, boy, he is Satan. You just know it. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, start praying for your boss. What do you mean pray for my boss? Start praying for your boss. I'll never forget when I taught school, I had a certain student. Sat right over here, actually. I was going to point at you. But he sat over here where George's face is. Figures George. I know George is watching at home. But, but sat right about where George is. And that student would misbehave every day. And so literally right when that student would come in, I would notice that student and typically they got called out right away in the beginning of class. And I was just student teaching and I talked to my professor and I said, what can I do about that? And my Christian professor said, next time go and sit in their seat before school and pray for them. You know what was amazing? That student was totally different the next day. That's a lie. That student was exactly the way they always were. But I changed. All of a sudden, instead of seeing that student as the enemy, I thought of that student as somebody who needed the love of Christ. And it changed how I treated that student. Now, I will tell you this. Over time, that student also began to act better. But if he had never changed, I had changed. And that was the part that God was worried about. Too often we're worried about God changing our circumstances, changing other people, fixing something, taking coronavirus away, right? To getting, getting rid of whatever. If it, you know, just tomorrow, if that could just disappear, I'd be better. And I remember sitting in the hospital for 30 days, having no control and thinking, the one thing I can do is say, God, thank you for what you've given me. And God, I'm going to pray for these nurses and these doctors who come in the room. And I would stop doctors who finished uh, 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 giving me advice and saying, can I pray for you real quick? I promise not to pray for the missionaries. And they'd laugh. And then they'd let me pray for them. I did that day after day, week after week. Doctors who came in. Listen, no matter what circumstance you're in, it's not the circumstance that matters. Ask the Holy Spirit, show me what to say. Can I tell you what I pray a lot of times? God, show me what not to say. Because usually we're impulsive, especially men. Sometimes we say things and then right after we say them, we go, oh, no. But if you allow the Holy Spirit to give you that check to remind you. So listen, let your life prepare the way. Listen to what the Spirit has to say. Number three, obey without delay. Now, I lived in a college dorm my first year away at college. I had four roommates. Three roommates, four of us. Two of them were in the same room I was in. One was in this little cubby. I was so jealous. But he got there first. And one of my roommates loved his snooze button. 
and he had an early class and I did not. And he would come in late and he was a heel walker. Do you know what I mean by a heel walker? I can't even do it without hurting my feet. He would come in and we had wood floors in our dorm. And he'd wake everybody up coming in. And then in the morning, his alarm would go off and he'd hit the snooze button. And then he'd hit the snooze button. And then he'd hit the snooze button until our other roommate and I finally went, Will you get out of bed? Too often, we're like that with God. God, I'll obey you after this. God, I'll obey you when I get to this point in my life. God, I'll serve you when I get to this point in my life. Once my kids grow up, once, once my kids go off to college, once, my, once this happens, once this happens, once this happens. And the Bible talks about obedience without delay. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, that's Peter, by the way, and his brother Andrew, sons of thunder. By the way, uh, uh, this book early on was also, instead of Mark, called Sons of Thunder. That was one of the other names given to, to the book of Mark. Sons of Thunder. I kind of like that. I might change it back. Today we're going to be reading from Sons of Thunder. Doesn't that sound like a WWF? All right. Anyway, Simon and his brother Andrew, who were both wrestlers. No, they weren't. Okay. Casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once. Do you hear that? At once they left their nets and followed him. When they had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, which is just fun to say. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Now, let me tell you how life works. I have never met anybody who woke up one day and said, Eric, one day I woke up. And I put heroin in my veins. No. Nobody's ever told me that. Now if that's ever happened to anybody. Please call me. I'd love to be wrong about this. But here's what I see. Eric. I say. How did you end up on heroin? How did you end up in jail? Well. My friends were, were smoking pot. And I decided I would try it. And then. You know. One day. They were trying something a little stronger. They were doing a little bit of, of cocaine. And I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll drink with them. They're, they're drinking. And they're, oh, they, they, they said, just try it. And then I, I found myself. I couldn't give that up anymore. But I wasn't getting high anymore. And then somebody introduced me to the next drug. You see how it works? But let me show you something else. Somebody doesn't just hopefully become a missionary or a pastor. Or somebody who ministers to people or does God's will. How does it work? Lord, this morning, I'm going to spend time with you. God, this morning, I'm going to allow you in my word. God, today, as I deal with this person, I'm going to allow your spirit to show me how to pray for them. As you continue to make choices and choose what God wants you to do, you will find yourself pulled more towards doing his will. Those good habits will begin to become Natural, but first you have to take those steps of obedience. You can't keep hitting the obedience snooze button over and over and think that it's not going to matter. Because it's just those little choices. Now, it doesn't have to be drugs. It can be little bitty choices like, oh, I'm just going to sleep in today. You know what? I'm not going to go to small group anymore. That person was not nice to me. And then we find that we're isolated. We can't figure out why we're not growing as a Christian. So what do we do? We say, God, you know what? I'm going to start to make a choice to spend time in your word. God, I'm going to spend time with other Christians. God, I'm going to go on my way to connect with people and to love them and encourage them. I'm going to look for ways to serve them. And you find yourself making those choices to be obedient. If you're at home, I want you to repeat after me these two words. And you can say it if you're in here. You ready for this? Here's the two words you need to learn to say. You ready? Yes, Lord. Ready? One, two, three. Yes, all right, at home. Ready? One, two, three. Yes, Lord. Nice. I heard you all the way in here. That was awesome. So let your life prepare the way. Listen to what the Spirit has to say. Obey without delay. And finally, number four. Pray to start your day. Pray to start your day. So yesterday, like many people, I cooked bratwurst and hamburgers. Now, I'm a terrible hamburger cook, but I have something, something new, and I'm so excited about it. And this is not it, because I used it yesterday, and now I can't find it. <laughs> but do you know what this is? This is the outside of a chef's professional thermometer. And here's what I never knew. I actually read the directions. 
And did you know when you get a real chef's thermometer, you're supposed to take it and you're supposed to put it in some shaved ice and some cold water and adjust it. If you want it perfect temperature, you need to adjust that so it's at 32. And there's a little wrench on here. And you adjust it so it's 32. And every once in a while they say you need to do that, especially after you wash it or do something. So you got to recalibrate it. Listen, as you go through your day, as you go through life, you're going to get uncalibrated. It's easy in this world to have that selfish gravity to make you selfish and self-centered. Listen, you can be a Christian for years. And begin seeking your own will. You can walk with God day after day. And then find yourself with no joy in your life. Why? Because you forgot what matters the most. You got to get recalibrated. How do you do that? Spend time in prayer. Spend time in God's word. If you're spending six hours a day watching the news. And spending five minutes in your Bible. Your calibration is off. I'm not even going to say it might be off. I'm going to tell you it's off. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Mark 135, Jesus got up, left the house. I said Jesus like a TV preacher just now. That was really funny. Jesus. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went, listen to this, to a solitary place where he prayed. Listen, you know what happens when you try to pray in bed? You go to Church of the Inner Spring, Pastor Pillow, Reverend Sheets, Right? Before you know it, you try to pray in the next thing. But it's the best sleep you've ever gotten, though. It's amazing, isn't it? Listen, if you're having a hard time sleeping at night, try praying. It might just drop you right into sleep. Say, if Satan's trying to wake you up, he doesn't want you to stay awake. He'll put you right back to sleep. So here's the thing. So he goes to a solitary place where he prays. Simon and his companions. There's Peter again. See, Peter's telling the story, remember? Went to look for him. And when they found him, they said, everyone's looking for you. By the way, life is always going to seem to be more important than taking time to recalibrate. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else. To the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That's why I've come. So he traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. You'll notice a total change in what Jesus was doing. We know from the story that Jesus had been healing people. All the day before. People were lining up at his door. Surrounding his door. And then he goes out to pray. And then he says, you know what? We're supposed to do something else today. If you'll take time to recalibrate. To to look at your life and say, God, would you speak to me as I spend time in your word, as I spend time in the Bible? He will help. Listen, when you find the worries of your life are overwhelming, he will change you. When you find that you have a hard time forgiving somebody, he'll help you to take those steps to move from unforgiveness To at least wanting to forgive. To be willing to forgive. To learning to forgive. To choosing to forgive. To walking in forgiveness. Isn't this a much better place? But you have to be recalibrated through his word. You have to let him change you. That Bible says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you do that? You spend time in the Bible. You spend time in prayer. I'm going to give you a very simple way to pray real quick. It's using the word acts. A-C-T-S. A stands for adoration. Spend time saying, God, I adore you. You're awesome. You're amazing. You're powerful. C is confession. You go through your day and you think of what what you did yesterday. or, Or it could have been five minutes ago. God, forgive me for the way I was thinking. Forgive me for the thoughts that I had. Forgive me for walking in frustration. Forgive me for trying to be in control. And then T is thanksgiving. Take some time to be thankful. And then the S is for supplication. It means to pray for yourself and to pray for other people. By the way, if you want to change your thinking, one of the best things you can do is pray for other people. So if you're mad at somebody... Or if you're struggling with somebody, pray for them. Pray for them more than you think about the movie of all the things you would have said and done. (laughs) Pray for them more than you think about how you would fix it. Or how they could be a better person. Or they shouldn't do what they did. Take more time to pray for them and recalibrate your life. You know, Nero began killing Christians. And one of the things that Herodotus, the historian, talked about is how when Nero would kill Christians, he found no satisfaction in it. Because no matter how he tried to kill them, true Christians had the peace of God on their face, no matter what happened. 
I think for so many of us, we've let the world so infiltrate us that we're full of fear and doubt and frustration and unforgiveness. We're more concerned about being Americans than being Christians, and that should never be for Christians. It should always be Christ first for us. And when we do that, that makes us better citizens. It makes us better people, people who love. And so my prayer for you is that you would have You would let your life prepare the way. That you'd be able to listen to what the Spirit has to say. That you would obey without delay. But then that you every day would spend time in prayer. Allowing God to change your heart. Change your life. Take some time this week. Read Mark chapter 1. If you're here today or watching online. And you don't have a relationship with Christ. Being a Christian doesn't just mean you know about Jesus. It doesn't just mean you understand biblical things. It's this whole idea of surrendering your life to him. Of saying, I'm not going to be in charge of my life. I surrender my life, my thinking to you. God, I want to obey you. What do you want me to do? And so today, if you're ready to surrender your life to him, you know that Jesus died and rose again for your sins. You can surrender your life to him and say, Jesus, forgive my sins. Would you come into my life and save me? You can do that today. And if you want to do that or have done that, you can send me a note, an email, and I'd love to talk to you or maybe even Zoom or Facebook uh, uh, to talk about how to take that next step of obedience. If you're here today and as I spoke today, there was something that stood out. Maybe you haven't prayed the way you should pray. Maybe you haven't spent time in God's word. Maybe you've allowed the world to cloud your thinking. I encourage you, take whatever step of obedience to move away from disobedience to move to obedience, to do God's will in your life. And then your heart will be prepared for him to move in you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these moments. I thank you for this message. I thank you for Mark chapter 2. Lord, I pray that you would change us. Help us to not walk, not consider it normal to think of everything but you. But Father, to become Christians that focus on you, that our first thought would be towards what you would want. That our first thought would be, yes, Lord. Lord, clean us up. Change us. Recalibrate our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen.